Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. I'm hesitant to bring politics into the show, so I'm going to do my best not to. I'll just say that the political situation in my country isn't what I'd hoped for, and things seem to be trending downward. Regardless of politics, you need to be careful with your tech and what you carry with you, no matter what the political climate. I often have multiple devices on or near me while I work or when I travel, and I believe most of us are kind of like that. We've gotten to the point where our devices are an extension of ourselves. I mean, would you let a total stranger look through your smartphone? Would you just leave your computer sitting on a table at a coffee shop? For many of us, these questions are the same as asking, would you leave your front door unlocked and a stack of $20 bills sitting on the table? No matter what your reality, you should probably keep your devices close to you, both physically and figuratively. Everything should be locked down. You can't get into my phone without a fingerprint or a passcode. Every computer I own is locked down with a pretty decent password that would be hard to guess. Even my watch has a passcode on it. Why? Because my watch talks to my phone. Oh, and that's the other thing you need to be aware of. That our devices are social. They talk to each other. My phone can talk to my computer, and it also talks to my watch, and my computer can do things with the tablet, which can also talk to my phone, and so on. All of my computers can communicate with each other in some manner, be it syncing services or direct connections via remote desktops and secure shells, whatever. There's there's just so many ways. And that's fine. I mean, that's normal. That's kind of what these things are for. These days you'll find that disconnecting a computer from the internet kind of cuts its usefulness in half, if not more. So, when you need to be careful, when you need to go dark, when you're dropping off the grid for whatever reason, you're going to need a tool you may not have considered. You need a burner laptop. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, Episode 51, Part 1, Burner. My name is Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, and welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersections of libraries and technology and helps you live that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hey there, ladies and gentlemen, and genders outside and in between, Cyberpunk Librarian is rolling down the RSS and into your ear holes through the magic of digital audio and open-source technology. We are back with a big two-part show about staying safe in meat space and the meta space, and that is our online world. And within this two-part episode, my lovelies, we're going to talk about a tool you might want to consider for those times when you need to go dark on the net. Now, this all sounds like some kind of spy movie or you know, hackers or sneakers or cyberpunk noir or something like that. The truth is, this isn't a movie, because if this were a movie, then Rosario Dawson and Kate McKinnon would bust through that door right now and we'd all head out on a kick-ass kung fu killer adventure. Damn it, that never works. Oh well. Some scientists think we might be living in a simulation. It sure as heck isn't my simulation. Where were we? Uh, Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, so... There are a myriad of reasons you might want to go dark. A really good one that's absolutely mundane? Banking. Do you pay your bills and manage your money online? You should really think about doing that with a few extra layers of protection. Are you into any investments? You definitely want to protect that. 
You want to buy a gift for your partner and don't want them to accidentally find it in your browser history along with all those porn sites that you visit? Well, that's a good reason to go dark too. Or maybe you just live in circumstances where you can't openly say the things you want to say or communicate with the people you want to talk to. This isn't fear of a dark government. This is some basic teenage life for some young adults. I don't know how many teens listen to the show, but maybe you know someone like this in this situation. My point is, we are, you know, there are all kinds of situations and factors where ghosting on the web is preferable. And we're not talking Case and Molly, Keanu Reeves as Johnny Mnemonic going all shadow run taking down the man. But hey, if you have the need, well, I'm just saying. Now, there are all kinds of tools and software that will help you do this right on the machine that you normally use. And we'll talk about some of those tools here in a few minutes. But you know what? Those tools are kind of interesting to nerds like me, but maybe not so much to others. You know what's interesting to a much larger cross-section of people? Going to extremes. Unlike Billy Joel, I do know why I go to extremes. Because that's where the fun is. You don't go to Disneyland and only ride the teacups and then go home, do you? Heck no, you have to get on Splash Mountain and do the Haunted Mansion and Small World so you can have that song running through your head for the rest of the week. You have to at least find one of the five places where you can buy beer. You gotta catch the electrical parade, find the hidden Mickey, slip someone a Mickey and then steal their money because you spent all yours on beer at the Cove Bar and all you bought was two beers. Good lord, that beer is expensive. Or maybe that's just me. I, I don't know. We were talking about going to its dreams, right? So let's go to its dreams. We're going to set up an inexpensive laptop as a burner device. I mean a laptop that when things hit the fan, you can drop that laptop in a bin somewhere and walk away never to see it again. Now, you might be thinking, a laptop? Wouldn't a phone be a better option? Maybe a tablet? Well... No, I don't think so. Actually, the phone is, in my opinion, the worst option, and the tablet is only slightly better than the phone. We'll get into that, but first, let's get into what you're going to need to look for in a laptop that you're setting up for possible abandonment. As we get started here, let's just get one thing out of the way. I'm sure you've heard of burner phones or burner tablets even, or something like that. Maybe it was on the television or whatever. The thing is, a cell phone, especially a smartphone, is capable of broadcasting your location. Even the cheap ones have GPS functionality, and if it's going to work, then GPS has to be a two-way communication. The functions that we like in a smartphone are part of the very reason that you don't want it as the device you can abandon. Did you use the camera to take a picture? Then it probably geotagged that image, and even if it's not easy to denote, you know, or kind of decipher where that location is from the image, there just might be data tagged to the image that says exactly where that location is. So many uh, Android phones have Google services that just kind of basically follow you around and use it as a service to help you find things that it thinks you want. So you know, it, it literally leaves a digital trail of breadcrumbs on the phone. Even merely using the phone as a phone can set you up for a trace or a triangulation. That doesn't mean burner phones aren't without their uses. Obviously, they, they have their uses. But be aware and be informed. Tablets share pretty much all the same issues as a smartphone, except they usually can't make phone calls, at least not without an app of some kind. If there's a better thing about tablets, it's that, it's that most of them don't use the cell service, and they require a Wi-Fi connection instead. Now, of course, there are tablets out there that can be hooked up to a cellular network, but we'll kind of leave those aside and just talk about the Wi-Fi connection, which can be anonymized, but... Still, many tablets have GPS capabilities too, so that problem arises again. 
Laptops, on the other hand, especially the inexpensive laptops, are much more general purpose and lack the sophisticated GPS of smartphones and tablets. Now, to be sure, there are laptops out there that have GPS capabilities, but for the more inexpensive ones, not so much. You need a Wi-Fi or wired connection to go online most of the time, and those things are much more easily anonymized than you can do on a cellular phone. Smartphones and tablets are designed to be left powered on all the time, where a laptop is easier to shut down and go 100% dark. With the right kind of laptop, you can shut it down, pull the plug, detach the battery, and there is nothing left in the Ethernet. Now, before I get to what I use for a burner, I want to cover some basic ideas. There is so much wiggle room here for what you might want in a burnable lappy. I mean, I suppose you could get a MacBook Pro or a Dell XPS as a burner, but... Before you do that, let me give you my list first of what I think might be important, and if you like, you can just send that money to me instead. Now, what you're looking for in a burner can be boiled down to four key things, what I call the three I's and an F. You want it to be inexpensive, innocuous, inconspicuous, and functional. Now, taking those things, let's talk about price. A burnable laptop is something you need to be willing to walk away from without a second thought. Maybe you're made of money, but I don't know. For me, I want something where the price is low enough that it's not going to be a huge financial hit if I have to drop this thing in a back alley dumpster or physically spike the hard drive. As far as inconspicuousness, you want this laptop to be as generic, run-of-the-mill as possible. It should be black or blue or gray or some normal laptop color. If you're thinking about that hot pink little number with the teal highlights, and I swear I think HP makes a machine like that, then you're in the wrong headspace for this kind of thing. When someone is asked to describe what your laptop looks like, that description should fit at least 90% of every other laptop out there in the world. Innocuous. If you plaster your burner laptop with DEF CON and 2600 stickers along with a Banksy-esque image of your middle finger, then you're doing it wrong. If your desktop wallpaper on your burner is something awesome and unique, you are also, again, doing it wrong. Your everyday laptop should look like your laptop, so go ahead and go nuts with the stickers and the eye candy and that wallpaper of Idris Elba or whatever. But for your burner laptop, it should be as inoffensive as possible. If it looks like a hacker's deck, use something else. I need to point out that when it comes to the functionality, don't think of the burner as your laptop. It's not your laptop. It's the dumpster's laptop. You're just borrowing it, borrowing it until the dumpster needs it back. Your everyday deck is probably a decent machine, and you've done some personalization and customization, and that's fine. That's a nice laptop, and you don't put nice things in the dumpster with a hole in the drive. Your burner is disposable and it should look garden variety from day one. Finally, functionality. We're already talking about an inexpensive bit of kit here, but that doesn't mean you want something that will take five minutes to render a web page. If the thing takes forever to load and run a browser, then it's not right for you. It doesn't need to be high spec. Indeed, that's probably what you don't want. But you want something capable of running the operating system, a browser, some basic tools, and being able to do that in an acceptable amount of time. And that's why I use an old Acer Aspire 1 netbook, specifically the model D150-1165. They've got some great, yeah, great model numbers there. This unit sports a 1.6 gigahertz Intel Atom N270 processor with a full gig of RAM. Its 160 gig hard drive provides ample storage for data and operating system, and you can't overlook the Intel GMA 950 graphic processor, the integrated webcam, or the 802.11b/g Wi-Fi capabilities. With three USB 2.0 ports, headphone and mic jacks, VGA out, and an Ethernet jack, you'd think it was already fully loaded. But hey, don't forget about the integrated SD card reader. Its 10.1 inch, 25.7 centimeter display features a resolution of 1024 by 600 in widescreen format. Yes, it was the MacBook Pro of its day, said no one ever. 
This little netbook was released in 2009, so it's about six years old as I record this. My mom used it for several years until she got a Chromebook about a year ago and gave the thing to me. It shipped with Windows XP Home Edition, which was so woefully configured that it couldn't run it worth a damn. So, soon after she got it, I did the sensible thing and installed Zubuntu Linux. Showed her how to launch the web browser and that she did everything in any way, and it was great. It's not the fastest thing on the block, but it will get the job done. And it's everything you would want in a sensible burner. It's small. At an even 3 pounds or 1.4 kilograms, it's lightweight. You could put this in a backpack, a messenger bag, a running bag, a book tote, or you could put it in the side pocket of your briefcase and still have room left over. It's thick, yes, but not overly so at 1.3 inches or 3.3 centimeters. There is, you know, there are plenty of mis modern business laptops out there that are thicker than this thing. It's totally nondescript, too. It's a dark blue laptop with black trim. And that's exactly what you want in a burner. This thing isn't expensive to buy used. I found a very similar model to mine on eBay for less than 80 bucks. There's nothing particularly outstanding about it, but it's more than capable of running a lightweight Linux distro that, as you install it, can be set to encrypt the entire drive and your home directory. The speed is decent, and it's one of those systems where it may take a minute to get the browser up and running, but once it's running, it's fine. What I'm saying that is, in the realm of burners, you don't want, or even need, something expensive. A used netbook is just about perfect so long as it's not one of those original EPCs or something. I think someone could have a heck of an aftermarket side business prepping and selling netbooks specifically customized as burners. If you want something on the newer side of things, you could look into the computers that they sell at Targets and Walmarts and big box stores like that. The biggest issue is that those things are cheaply made and you kind of get what you pay for. I'm fairly certain I could hit a man with my burner laptop and then boot it up. Some of those computers in the big box stores look like they'd crack if you gaze at them hard enough. You could also make a go of it with a Chromebook, but I offer a warning there. Unless you're into your burner device sending all your data to Google, I take the time to install Linux on it. Turns out it's not even that hard, and I'll have a link in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast that'll guide you through it. And then, don't do something like install Linux and then Google Chrome. Come on, darlings, you know better than that. In the end, I recommend something geared towards portability when it comes to a burner. You want to be able to carry it easily if needed, so a vintage 2008 laptop that weighs in its 6.5 pounds, or roughly 3 kilograms, might be something to avoid. And I only say that as someone who once owned a vintage 2008 Toshiba laptop that weighed 6.5 pounds. Okay, so, with some ideas of what we need in a device, let's follow this up with some ideas of what we need to put on it, and what to use, and more importantly, how to use it. talking about a burner laptop, you want something that you can not only leave behind, but also know that there's no easy way to use the device against you. That overarching thought goes into all of the things I'm about to recommend when it comes to setup and software. Now, there are dozens of ways you can go about this, and I'm not a security expert. Look around and see if you can find something better if you like, and I'm sure you can. So I'm just going to talk about what's working for me and what I've got working for me, and maybe that helps you off on your path, okay? Right on then. So let's talk about the operating system first. My old netbook isn't exactly a beast of a machine, but that's okay because I don't have to run Windows on it at all. Instead, I'm currently running Zubuntu 16.04 LTS. For those who might not know, 
Zubuntu is an Ubuntu Linux flavor that uses the very lightweight XFCE desktop environment over the heavier Unity environment that comes with stock Ubuntu. Because of that, Zubuntu will run on a slightly slower processor with a lower amount of RAM. In my case, that thing only has one gig of memory, though Zubuntu will operate easily on half of that. I recommend Linux over Windows every time when it comes to personal data security. Microsoft has a habit of tracking your usage of the computer, and they've got their reasons to do so. They're trying to make their product better, and that's fine, though Windows 10 is really starting to get intrusive about what kind of data they supposedly need from you. Linux doesn't do that, or at least Ubuntu doesn't do that. Beyond that, Linux has better encryption options upon installation, and that encryption has been vetted by the eyes of the community looking at the code that drives it. One more tip. When you install most any operating system from Linux to Windows to Mac OS, you're going to get asked what you might want to name your computer. This is a required step most of the time, as it helps networks assign a unique IP to your computer, you know, when it connects to its Wi-Fi network or something like that. So, you can't skip it. And for the love of the cosmos, if your name is Jessica, don't name your computer something like Jessica's Burner. Name it something incredibly generic that doesn't connect it to you in any meaningful way. I won't tell you what the name of my Acer is, but it has nothing to do with me. Okay, so back to encryption. When you install Zubuntu or most other Ubuntu flavors, you're given some choices about hard drive encryption. The first is the installer is going to ask you if you want to encrypt the entire drive. And the answer, my friends, is yes, you do. After that, it will ask you if you want to encrypt your home folder for your user as well. And once again, that answer is yes. With the idea in mind that there is always the possibility of cryptanalysis with a $5 wrench, if you do have to ditch this laptop, you can take heart in the fact that its contents are locked down so long as it's powered off. Which brings us to a quick bit of OPSEC, or operational security for those unfamiliar with the term. OPSEC handles a lot of things, but at its, its base level, it also depends on how you handle the security in your operations. Chances are you engage in some level of OPSEC every day without even knowing about it. For instance, when you leave your computer at work, perhaps to go to the restroom, do you lock it? If you're using Windows, a simple Windows key plus the L key will lock your computer, and that keeps Eddie in accounting from changing your wallpaper like he did that one time. Eddie's a bit of a jackass, so you want to keep him out of your computer, and so you lock it. That's a basic bit of OPSEC. You're securing access to your computer, your connection, and your data so people don't come around and naff about with it. You need to be aware of doing this with your burner, too. The point of your burner isn't to just abandon it willy-nilly and then run away like the knights in a Monty Python movie. I mean, hold on to the thing if you can, because the easiest method of making sure no one gets access to your burner is to always have it, and thus no one can access it. But in the meantime, if you aren't actively using it, just don't just, you know, don't just log out and suspend it. Don't just put it to sleep. Don't let it hibernate. If you're not using the burner, turn it off completely. There's an old joke that the safest computer in the world is the one that's not turned on, and that's true. If your computer is in sleep mode, it might still have an active network connection. You don't want that. If you're not going to use that laptop for a while, turn it off. Because if you opted for the encryption when you install the OS, and you did, right? That encryption takes full effect when the computer is powered off, because one of the last things that Linux does when you shut down is encrypt the drive and your home folder. It only does the decryption on startup, so if the computer is turned off, it's encrypted. One last bit of operational security. Keep that burner physically safe. If you're using it at a coffee shop, don't sit where people can see the screen. If you need to pee because you drank too much coffee, take the burner to the bathroom with you rather than leaving it on the table. Don't sit so people can see what you're typing on the keyboard. Be mindful of where the security cameras are because, well, if they're HD video, then it's trivial to see what someone was typing. 
Cover your hands if you need to. And if all of this sounds paranoid, well, keep in mind, I wouldn't bring this kind of thing up if it hadn't happened. The best bit of keeping your operation, your burner, and your data safe? Don't do private things in public. Seriously, that's a big part of it. But if you must, sit somewhere that your screen and keyboard are visually separated from the world around you. And try not to think about the fact that there exists technology to log your keystrokes by their sound. See the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast for a link to Bruce Schneier's blog and an article about that very thing. The fact is, you took a chance today when you went outside. But that doesn't mean you have to take unnecessary chances, you know? Okay, so we've installed Linux because it's not Windows and because we're not using a Mac. We've opted for full encryption of the drive and the home folder. Great. Now what? Well, you need apps, of course. Some apps are given, like a web browser. Other apps you want because of their inherent security features. But, first things first, you want a VPN. You might not know that you want a VPN, but let me assure you that you want a VPN. You'll want your own VPN account that is not your work VPN account, assuming that you have one. Some people do, some people don't. But the work VPN account can be compromised by, surprise, somebody you work with. After all, it's your work's VPN, isn't it? It doesn't belong to you. You will want a paid VPN subscription. If you want to get extra paranoid, you can pay with preloaded debit cards or whatever. But VPNs don't denote anything shady on their own. If anything, they actually say that you understand that using public Wi-Fi is kind of like having unprotected sex. But the reason that you want a paid subscription goes back to the whole idea of, if you're not a customer, then you are the product. A paid VPN service is far better than a free one, and while I know that the Opera web browser comes with a free VPN, if you dig into the guts of that, you will find out it's not a VPN so much as it is a proxy. And a proxy just isn't as good as a VPN. I'll have a link to, the, uh, to an article about that in the show notes if you want to learn more. Anyway, a VPN, or a virtual private network, basically takes your computer's network communications and routes them through an encrypted tunnel on the net. So while someone looking at that network traffic could tell that you're using a VPN, they can't see what you're doing on it. Just like I can look at a tunnel, but not know how many cars are in it. Even better, a VPN can make it look like you're somewhere you aren't. For instance, you can connect to a VPN routing your network traffic through London, and you'll appear to be in London even though you're in a Starbucks in Austin, Texas. So not only does a VPN help secure your data, it can also help obscure your physical location. Personally, I've used a service called Private Internet Access for years, and believe me, they're not a sponsor of the show because there are no sponsors for the show. But I've been really, I've been really happy with them. I pay a yearly subscription, and that means I think about it once a year when I have to pay for it again. Since I use Windows, Macs, and Linux, you know that it works on all of those operating systems, and they have apps for iOS and Android, too. But do some research and find the one that works for you. There will be another link in the show notes to the running reviews of VPNs at PC Magazine's website. It's a pretty decent place to start looking. But also, you know, check with your friends. See if they're using something and what they think of it. You know, sometimes the best recommendation comes from the people you trust, you know? Whichever your VPN decision, make sure they work with the operating system on your burner. Now, most all of them do, but it's worthwhile to check. You don't want to get caught with your pants down after paying, say, 30 bucks or 40 bucks for a year and then finding out it doesn't work on Linux or something silly like that. I can totally understand if your burner isn't running Linux, but make damn sure you're running a VPN. Indeed, if you're using a burner on a network, always use the VPN. If for some reason the VPN isn't working on that public Wi-Fi system, then don't use it there. Go find a different system. Go find a different coffee shop or something. And in all of this, don't get me wrong. Public Wi-Fi is a great thing. Libraries offer public Wi-Fi, and they typically set it up so traffic is pretty anonymized. Public Wi-Fi is useful when you don't want to be linked to activity on your own home network. It 
helps anonymize you. It distances you from the normal communications at your residence. But as I said, operating a computer on public Wi-Fi without using VPN is taking a chance that you don't have to take. Get the VPN. It's worth every penny. Okay, hardware, operating system, and network security is done. And you know what else is done? Part one. Tune in later this week and we'll dive into the software part of your burner laptop. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org, a great repository of content and a fantastic service that you can find online and make use for absolutely free. Check out the Internet Archive at archive.org for all kinds of software and movies and music and podcasts like this and podcasts that are absolutely nothing like this. Great people doing great things. Once again, a big shout out to the Internet Archive. The song you're currently digging on is Untitled One Anonymous Version by Pollux. Earlier in the show, you heard The Northern Lights and Methamphetamine by Alien and Answering M by Sro. As always, the title track is Belly Dance to Bisu by Rio Miyashita, and you can find links to those songs in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Do you have something to say either to me or to the community? Maybe it's an idea for a show or maybe you'd like to chip in something that I didn't cover here on this episode or another episode or something like that. Well, there are a few places you can do that. The Cyberpunk Librarian community on MZ, that's imzy.com, is pretty freaking hopping sometimes. It's been a little it's been a little slow recently just because I've been really busy with the uh with a few projects at work, which actually are going to come up in a uh, in another show at some point. But you can join us there at imzy.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. And a few folks asked if I could open up my Facebook thing again, because that's where they are. And even though I totally don't like Facebook, well, you know, that's, that's the thing. If the listeners want it, well, I'm here for the listeners. So you can also join the community at facebook.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. I typically post the same things in both places, but hey, you know, get use the one that works for you. If you want to contact me more directly, I am on Twitter at Vibrarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. You can also find me on Google.com slash plus Daniel Messer for the Google Plus action. Or if you just want to use that old-fashioned SMTP method of sending an email, well, I'm cyberpunklibrarian at protonmail.com. Drop me a line. I would love to hear from you. And until part two. And until the next time I talk to you, hey, you don't have to be high tech to be low budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care now.